What will happen when the sun dies? Ah, the sun. A lovely ball of gas that keeps us alive. She's just so pretty, isn't she? Well, one day she'll try to kill us. So do you think she's still pretty? Huh? Do you? Answer me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Don't know what came over me. Today we're talking about the sun, or more specifically, what will happen when the sun dies. Look, I get it. It's not entirely a hypothetical because the sun will one day die. All good things must come to an end. But I promise I'll make it worthwhile for you on the hypothetical side of things, so stay tuned. The sun formed about 4.6 billion years ago when a giant spinning gas cloud, known as a nebula, collapsed in on itself due to its own gravity. This caused the nebula to spin faster and flatten into a disk. Once in disk form, all that gas and dust present in the nebula accumulated in the center and through the magic of physics, chemistry, and other sciences, the sun was born. As a whole, this process took about 20 million years. The remaining gas and dust left over went on to form the planets of our solar system, as well as various moons, the asteroid belt, and other stuff like that. That's the basics of our solar system as a whole, so now let's turn our attention back to the sun. The sun is a G-class star. You'll learn more about that in a second and is set to officially die in about 5 billion years. But some very interesting stuff will occur during this process. To understand that though, we need to first make some comparisons. How does the sun compare to other stars in our vast universe? Stars in our universe can vary a lot in brightness, size, color, and their behavior. Stars can also go from one type to another type in their lifetime. There are many different types of stars in our universe. The first kind we need to talk about are main sequence stars. Main sequence stars account for about 90% of all stars in the universe, and the sun is no exception. As previously mentioned, the sun is a G-class star, making it a main sequence star. There are also main sequence stars in the M-class, the K-class, the F-class, the A-class, the B-class, and finally the O-class. The seven classes I just mentioned are all based on the temperature and size of stars. M-class stars are the smallest and coolest of the main sequence stars, while O-class stars are the biggest and hottest. Since the Sun is a G-class star, that means it's on the smaller and cooler side of the main sequence. But let's move on from that, shall we? There are plenty of other stars that we need to talk about. Giants, super giants, red dwarfs, white dwarfs, and brown dwarfs are all other stars that exist in the universe. It sounds like something straight out of a fairy tale, but they're all real objects. And before I get into the details, you need to remember that a star can move throughout multiple types in its lifetime. Okay, are you ready? We'll start with brown dwarfs because they're the least important. I'm not kidding, these things technically aren't even stars. They're kind of a weird in-between of planets and stars, as in they're more massive than planets, but not massive enough to be stars. Some brown dwarfs form in the same way as main sequence stars, but they never quite gain enough mass to have fusion begin in their cores. What's fusion? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I'll get to the details more in a bit, but for now, all you need to know is that every living star besides red dwarfs perform fusion in their cores. As millions of years go on, the elements in a star's core fuse into heavier and heavier ones until fusion can no longer occur. Now let's get back to talking about stars. Up next, we've got white dwarfs. Spoiler alert, I'll be talking about these more later on too, but for now, what you need to know is that white dwarfs are the stellar remnants of stars. They only exist when stars that aren't big enough to go supernova shed their outer layers. White dwarfs are the dead cores that remain. I know I'm teasing a lot, but I'll get more in depth on this process later on. Now let's address the other three star categories I mentioned. Red dwarfs are the most common type of star in the universe. They make up about 75% of stars in the Milky Way and are the smallest and coolest stars on the main sequence. They also last a really, really long time. Some scientists estimate their lifespans could be up to 14 trillion years long. Moving on, giants are stars that have a mass anywhere between 8 times to 100 times the mass of the sun. If you haven't figured it out by now, you'll learn how they form in a bit. Meanwhile, stars that have a similar mass to giants but are more luminous are known as supergiants. There's also such stars as hypergiants, which are unbelievably rare. Certain hypergiants have 150 times the mass of the sun and are 180 times the size of the sun. They're truly absurd. Okay, that's enough about stars. Remember that process I mentioned earlier, fusion? Let's get back to that and discuss why it's so important to a star's life. You still with me? You still have a pulse? I just threw a lot of info at you. I know I talk fast, but you gotta keep up. As I've already mentioned, fusion is a process that takes place in the core of every single star besides red dwarfs. But what is fusion, you ask? That's a great question, my dear viewer. Fusion is a type of nuclear reaction where the two nuclei of one element come together to form the nucleus of a different element. In the core of a star, immense gravity creates extremely high pressure and temperature, forcing the nuclei of atoms to combine. Stars are kept alive by a very delicate balance. All of their mass constantly pushes in on their core. The only the only thing keeping the core from collapsing in on itself is fusion, as fusion generates enough energy to push back on the immense gravity. However, not all stars face the threat of a core collapse. This section is going to be a bit heavy too, so bear with me. The fate of a star all depends on its total mass. For stars below 1.4 solar masses, they'll turn into something called planetary nebulae, which I'll explain in a bit. Meanwhile, stars between 1.4 to 8 solar masses undergo a supernova explosion while their cores collapse into neutron stars. I've got a short on my channel about neutron stars if you want to learn more about those, but for the sake of this video, we can ignore the 
the fate of stars this size. Finally, we've got stars between 10 to 30 solar masses. Stars of this size will undergo supernova explosions and leave nothing behind. This is where fusion comes into play again. I know I'm bouncing around a lot, but it'll all make sense in a second, I promise. Fusion, or rather a lack thereof, is ultimately what's responsible for stars going supernova. As stars above 10 solar masses grow older, the materials in their core fuse into heavier and heavier elements. Hydrogen fuses into helium, helium into carbon, carbon into oxygen, and so on and so on, until silicon is completely fused into iron. And here's where we hit a problem. You see, iron can't fuse. Because it's so heavy, it requires more energy to fuse than it releases, cutting off the fusion process. Remember how I mentioned that stars are kept alive by a delicate balance? With an iron core, that balance no longer exists. Once a star's core is entirely composed of iron, it runs out of fuel. The outward forces that were keeping the star from collapsing in on itself are no more. All of a sudden, boom, we've got a supernova. Supernovas can shine as brightly as 10 billion suns. They can also release as much energy as the sun does in its entire lifetime. They're incredibly destructive, but also redistribute matter back into the universe. I'm not trying to get all philosophical with you though, sorry about that. If you haven't figured it out by now, our sun won't meet this fate. As I've already said, only stars of a certain mass can go supernova, and our sun doesn't hit that limit. With that in mind, it's now time to discuss the details of our sun's life, more specifically where it goes from here. Currently, the sun is about 4.6 billion years old. Stars like it tend to burn for anywhere between 9 to 10 billion years. That means, with some quick calculations, our sun will be alive for around 5 billion more years, give or take a few hundred million. But it won't always remain the same. Remember how I mentioned earlier that stars have different stages to their lives? Our sun is no exception. I'm going to warn you right now that the numbers I'm about to throw at you might not all make sense. The math might not math entirely. That's because these are all estimates and we truly don't know what's exactly going to happen and when. Okay? Cool. About 4 to 5 billion years from now, hydrogen will stop fusing into helium in the sun's core. With the sun's core now entirely helium and fusion stopped, gravity will squeeze on it, increasing its temperatures. These temperatures will then heat up the sun's outer layer, causing it to expand. We've now entered the red giant phase. I'll talk more about the impacts of this phase in a second, but for now, just know that the sun would last as a red giant for about a billion years. Next comes the true death of our sun. Through an extremely confusing amount of chemical reactions, our home star will basically eject its outer layers completely. About 45% of the sun's mass is lost in this way, while the remaining 55% is compressed into the core which is now classified as a white dwarf. Over the course of about 100,000 years, the sun has now officially become what scientists like to inaccurately call a planetary nebula. I say inaccurately because they aren't planets at all, but early astronomers thought they were. Oh well, you guys weren't too far off. Finally, the sun exists as a white dwarf. The star is technically dead, as the white dwarf represents the last burning embers of a once thriving ball of gas. Not all is lost though, as some white dwarfs might be able to support life. We'll explore that possibility more later. For now, let's go more in depth on the sun's red giant phase and how it may impact us humans humans here on Earth. For the purpose of the rest of this video, we're going to assume that humans are still alive for the end of the sun's life. Otherwise, what's the point? Anyways, let me get something out of the way quick. The red giant phase will be the end of Earth. Our beautiful blue planet will be uninhabitable, as the sun will either swallow the Earth entirely or make it so the Earth orbits its host star extremely closely. Remember, the sun is expanding a ton in its red giant phase. Mercury and Venus will be swallowed up entirely because of how close they orbit the star. Oh, what's that? You want numbers? You're in luck. In its red giant phase, the sun will bloat to anywhere between 100 to 1,000 times wider than it is today. In other words, it's getting plumped. Long. Funnily enough though, the red giant version of our sun will actually be colder on its surface than our sun is today. Today, our sun's surface temperature sits at around 10,340 degrees Fahrenheit. In its red giant form, its surface temperature will be anywhere between 4,000 to 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't really matter though. If you're too close, you'll still be burnt to a crisp, and that's exactly where the Earth will be if it hasn't been swallowed up already. Humanity will need to find a new home. Where can we look? Mars is a start. Currently, Mars sits just on the outside edge of the sun's habitable zone, also known as the Goldilocks zone. The Earth sits just about in the middle. When the sun becomes a red giant, Giant, though, that habitable zone will be pushed back, and it's possible that Mars could be a place for life to go. People like Elon Musk are already looking into terraforming Mars, so it's definitely possible that could be humanity's next home. Even if Earth defies the odds and is still habitable just before the Sun enters its red giant phase, humanity could be on Mars long before that happens. After the Earth is gone, Mars could be our new home. Another place to look in our solar system is certain moons of gas giants. Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, all moons of Jupiter, host giant oceans beneath their icy surfaces. If the Sun expands enough, their surfaces could melt slightly, making 
making them more hospitable. We can also take a look at Titan and Enceladus, moons of Saturn. Enceladus, like Jupiter's moons that I just mentioned, features an ocean under its icy shell. Titan, meanwhile, is a bit more unique. It's the only moon in our solar system with a fully developed atmosphere. In fact, its atmosphere is about 50% denser than the one here on Earth. Titan also has clouds, weather, seasons, and maybe even lightning. Of course, right now it's extremely cold, but in the sun's red giant phase, things could change. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the possibility of interstellar travel. If humanity still exists 5 billion years from now, interstellar travel is probably a guarantee. It's possible that we leave the solar system entirely, opting to travel to nearby systems like Alpha Centauri or systems with potential super-Earths. Maybe we could even make it to the most habitable planet we know of besides Earth, Kepler 452b, which is just over 1400 light years away from our solar system. Regardless, even if some of humanity departs from the solar system, it's unlikely that everyone will. Those who can't afford interstellar travel will live out their days on Mars, Titan, Europa, etc. until the sun's red giant phase ends. After that, the solar system might truly die out. Once the sun turns into a planetary nebula, humanity will likely have to say goodbye to our solar system forever. It's a bit of a sad tale, but by this point, humans have ventured off into the Milky Way, leaving only a few poor souls behind to watch the sun shed off its outer layers and fade away. If humanity was still around in our solar system at this point, evacuations would be in order. They'd have plenty of time, as stars take about 100,000 years to completely shed their outer layers and become planetary nebulae. But as the solar system's life comes to a close, tensions would rise, and it's possible that some wouldn't be able to leave in time. Humans outside of our solar system, and maybe other life in the Milky Way, would look at our sun through telescopes and see a beautiful mirage of colors expanding throughout space. These would be the outer layers of the sun being shed. They'll stick around for a couple thousand years before dissipating into the void. It's a depressing thought, but I'll spin it in a way that could be more fun. Our solar system was never going to be humanity's home forever. If humans make it off of Earth, they're destined for the stars. On the grand scale of the universe, the solar system is humanity's womb. As of now, we are mere fetuses. What am I talking about? Seriously, what did I even write here? What am I saying? Who gave me a microphone? You get what I'm saying. The solar system will not be habitable forever. The hope, though, is that humanity can make it out in time and one day look back at its time in the solar system and think at least it was nice while it lasted. And who knows, maybe one day we could even return. As the dust settles and the gas clears, all that remains of the sun is its core, a white dwarf that casts an eerie glow across the remnants of the solar system. And here, my dear viewer, is where I reveal that I've kind of lied to you. I'm very sorry. <coughs> hey! Okay, that's enough. Let me explain. Once the sun turns into a planetary nebula, it's technically dead, but as I mentioned earlier, some white dwarfs could support life. They're extremely dim as they're about the size of Earth, but they're also very hot. The main issue now lies in the fact that the habitable zone of our white dwarf is way closer to the star than any of the planets that remain in our solar system. Even if Earth hadn't been swallowed up by the sun in its red giant phase, it would be too far away from the white dwarf to be habitable. Some objects could enter the solar system, be captured by the white dwarf's gravitational pull, and orbit the white dwarf in its habitable zone, but the odds of that are basically zero. Humanity could also develop some technology to move planets. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it's theoretically possible. Let's say Earth still exists and orbits the White Dwarf. By slowing down its orbit immensely using other large objects, Earth could be pulled closer to the White Dwarf. That's an extremely, extremely simplified explanation of that concept, but I promise it's possible. The question is more so about whether it would be practical. Unless humans wanted some extreme nostalgia trip, it probably wouldn't be worth moving the Earth closer to its White Dwarf companion. If we really miss home, it could be worth a shot, but us humans are probably far better off taking on the Milky Way. This video was meant to be way more lighthearted than my last one. I think it accomplished that, but to be honest, I'm not really sure. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this one. I plan on doing more science videos in the future, but want to make sure I'm getting a good mix of history and current events ones in there as well. Much like last time, I wasn't able to cover absolutely everything, but I did my best. If you've got suggestions for future videos, ways I can improve, or just want to say hi, feel free to do that in the comments down below. Feel free to follow me on TikTok and Instagram as well. I'll link them in the description. I do shorter content over there, and you can also find those videos in the short section on my YouTube channel. All of my research links for this video are down in the description. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I hope I see you next time. Take care.